Hello, this is new episode of program Euro Integrators and my guest today is Morten Enberg, head of Council of Europe office in Ukraine. Hello. Hello. According to the Council of Europe plan for Ukraine, there is a strong focus on reforming uh, judiciary and uh, prosecutor office. What uh, are the areas or what are their priorities of these reforms? Thank you for this question. Uh, yes, indeed, we do have an action plan between the government of Ukraine and Council of Europe starting from last year. Uh, the new one was adopted last year. Uh, part of the priorities of this action plan is uh, reform of the judiciary, including uh, also other law enforcement bodies, including the prosecutor's office. We um, have been focusing within the judiciary. We have been focusing lately on um, all on setting up the new court system that was decided after the changes to the constitution in, uh, regarding the judiciary on, in 2016. We have been supporting, we have given advice to the new text of the constitution, we have given advice to the following laws, uh, we have given advice regarding the setting up of the new bodies of the, of, of the judiciary, such mm -hmm. as the, mm -hmm. high qualification, uh, the for High Qualification Commission and also the High Council of Justice. Um, and with the Prosecutor's Office, it's also part of the, part of the action plan. And uh, I want to remind you that this action plan is developed together with our Ukrainian partners, together with the U Ukrainian authorities. Uh, so with the, with the prosecutor's office, for instance, right now, what we are doing right now, we have been doing a lot with them previously as well, but right now we are performing an assessment regarding managerial structures within the prosecutor's office. Uh, what is the result of your previous help to prosecutor's office? Uh, well, first of all, is that they have gone from a from a different type of system, where the where the investigatory system is now more separate and independent than it was before, mm -hmm. um, and the, it's gone from a four-tiered system to, to a three-tiered system. This is also in line with Council of Europe standards, as a few examples, and also very important with the prosecutor system, the setup of so-called self-governing bodies of the prosecutor system. Uh, the Disciplinary Commission and the High Commission for Prosecutors. What would you recommend to do about territorial communities who doesn't want to be amalgamated? In our view, decentralization is also, uh, apart from the judiciary reform, uh, decentralization is also a successful reform. Um, we are working very closely with the authorities on this. Uh, currently, we have about 30% of Ukrainian territory covered by newly amalgamated communities, but of course we need more. The government have uh, set up an ambitious plan that uh, the whole decentralization reform should be finished by 2020. Mm -hmm. um, what this will mean for the amalgamated communities, it's too early to say. That it might work with the voluntary aspect that is going on now. They are, they are amalgamating on a voluntary basis. But there are also discussions inside the government currently that maybe there will be, it will be necessary to have a separate law to promote amalgamation. If there will be a separate law and if the Council of Europe is asked to provide uh, assessment on this, uh, an assessment on this law, we will do that in accordance with our standards. Mm -hmm. They should do it before 2020, yes? This is the current plan that the government have do set out. Do you think out. they will be able to do it? I hope so. We will do our best to support it. Okay. Is the Council of Europe uh, is able to monitor situation with human rights uh, in the occupied territories of Crimea and Donbass? Um, during my tenure here in Ukraine, um, there has not been any official Council of Europe uh, visit to Crimea, but the Commissioner for Human Rights, the previous Commissioner for Human Rights, went to Donbass, to the occupied territories, uh, on a number of occasions. The newly elected Commissioner for Human Rights, uh, Dunja Mjatovic, uh, is planning to visit Ukraine the next year after the elections, as is the praxis. What places she will be able to visit at that time, I don't know yet. Mm -hmm. For now, uh, so th but this is the sort of mechanism we have for monitoring human rights. It's the Commissioner for Human Rights. Mm -hmm. So uh, it means that you are not working with some 
local uh, organization to monitor cases? No, my my oh, office, no. we do not have a mandate to work either on Crimea. Council of Europe uh, signs a memorandum with the Central Election Commission. Uh, how do you work with them and do you maybe in some kind of monitoring or that the election was honest and democratic? Uh, the office here in Ukraine, we do not do monitoring as such. Mm -hmm. We provide support to mm -hmm. the different uh, institutions, Ukrainian institutions. Uh, with the CEC, yes, we have a memorandum of cooperation. Uh, we provided support for these elections in developing a handbook for the precinct election commissions. Mm -hmm. There are almost 30,000 of them mm -hmm. uh, on how to work in accordance with the Ukrainian legislation on election day and during the whole procedure that they work. Um, we also supported with different trainings, for instance, for journalists on ethical reporting during elections, to mention a few things that we have done. And then we have the memorandum itself is a long-term cooperation plan. So it also includes such things as looking at various types of legislation, looking at um, issues regarding cyber security and many other areas. Mm -hmm. But you also mentioned me before that uh, you have a um, delegation of uh, parliamentaries mm -hmm. who are member of Council of Europe uh, Parliament Assembly. Yes. Who arrived to Ukraine to monitor first round of yes. presidential election and they expect to monitor the second round. So they are monitoring, but uh, as a personal individuals from their countries, yes? Yes, the, it's, there's a, from the Parliamentary Assembly, one of the institutions of Council of Europe, they monitor elections and they came here also with a delegation of parliamentarians uh, from the Parliamentary Assembly from different member states of the Council of Europe. 27 of them arrived during the first round of elections and if there will be second, a second round then they will arrive for the second round as well to monitor that. How do you see uh, Angela Merkel's speech on Munich conference which emphasized the need of solidarity in Europe? Uh, does Europe really need now more solidarity? And what about solidarity between Europe and Ukraine from your point of view? Well, I, do, I don't uh, want to comment on the Chancellor's speech in particular, but uh, one thing that we as Council of Europe do is that we develop common standards for all of our member states. The basic standard is, of course, what is written into the European Convention on Human Rights, the founding document of the Council of Europe. And based on this, we have we developed the same standards for all of our 47 member states. And to us, this is what the solidarity means, that we all adhere to the same democratic standards and principles. One more guest will join our interview now. It's uh, Sergei Tomilenko, head of National Journalists Union of Ukraine. Hi, Sergei. Uh, the Council of Europe developed a platform for uh, journalist protection and safety. Uh, what is the aim of this platform and how do you cooperate with Ukrainian organization as government and non-government? Well, the aim of this platform is, of course, to increase the safety for journalists. That's the main aim. We cooperate in Ukraine. Uh, both with uh, the organization called Institute for Mass Information, that is the, Ukraine, the, the Ukrainian organization that provides information to the platform about potential problems regarding safety of journalists. Mm -hmm. We also cooperate closely. I think it's reported cases already Pardon? there on this. It's not only potential problems. It's there are cases, cases. There are cases there, mm -hmm. and the the on the government side, we cooperate with uh, the Ministry for Information Policy. Mm -hmm. uh, they have reacted to several of these cases, and these this is our official partner on the government side. But for us, it's also important to work with the preventive side on this, which we do uh, also with with the ministry, with the Institute for Mass Information, but also, importantly, we work very well together with law enforcement ag uh, agencies on this. The prosecutors, the judges, the police, Minister of Interior. Mm -hmm. um, what we do is that we provide trainings to their, to, to the people working in these agencies. And um, regarding safety on journalists, what are the Council of Europe standards on safety of journalists? How can these 
the members of these different organizations, police, judges, prosecutors, etc., how can they improve their work to better protect journalists in Ukraine? This is an important part of what we're working with, and we have very good cooperation in this area. Uh, Sergey, uh, how do you work with this platform? Is it helpful for the National Journalists Union of Ukraine? As far as I know, you have uh, 18,000 uh, journalist members in your union. Do you report your cases into this platform? Yes, of course, they really help and we are thankful to the Council of Europe for their assistance and instruments regarding fighting impunity. Due to our partnership and membership in the European Federation of Journalists, we use our rights to recommend and present such cases, share information on attacking Ukrainian journalists and put it in this platform. Part of this information comes from our experts, from members of National Union of Journalists. It seems to me that Ministry of Information Policy and Ministry of Internal Affairs, they just demonstrate their activities, they just provide their formal explanations about how the investigation goes. I could mention one case that was registered in Berdyansk of Zaporizhia region, the story was about an attack on a journalist of a local TV channel. But later we saw the formal response instead of effective and productive investigation activities. So we need to start a kind of a broader public discussions of such issues. Our experts, journalists who suffered, are ready to become the part of the process together with representatives of Council of Europe and ministers I mentioned above. We have to provide some pressure to achieve fair and clear solutions on those cases. We don't want to have only formal respond letters in this platform. What can you say about uh, safety of journalists in Ukraine? How National Journalists Union of Ukraine cooperate with platform of Council of Europe? There are not so much cases in the platform as we mainly put here in the platform just resonance cases. I would mention about five or seven stories in one year period. We want to use national instruments more effectively, that's priority in our work. We would not like to overload the platform with many accidents which happen. The index of physical assaults against journalists in Ukraine is very high. So I would draw attention to the fact that we have very alarming figures regarding attacks on women working in the media. That index grew 50% last year and such situation becomes widespread in the country. This aggression is a frightening point. I can assure you that the attacks on women issue is also a priority for us. Thank you, Sergei, for joining our interview. In recent report of Council of Europe, uh, Russia intolerance, uh, Russian intolerance to Ukraine show quite high uh, numbers. Uh, does Council of Europe uh, work somehow to decrease level of intolerance or hate speech towards other nations or inside uh, countries? Uh, yeah, important question, of course. I mean, tolerance is part of, of one of our priorities inside the Council of Europe. Tolerance towards each of the citizens that are part of the Council of Europe and, of course, in general, toler tolerance towards your fellow human being, wherever he or she is from. We, um, we have done a lot of campaigns lately regarding, as you rightly mentioned, no hate speech. Uh, to increase tolerance towards all types of, uh, to, to, towards everyone inside the Council of Europe member states. So this is something that we have as a priority. What is the current situation with Russia in Council of Europe? Does the majority of the Council of Europe uh, Parliamentary Assembly support Russia continuing membership? And uh, how you do this uh, campaigns against hate speech if, as far as I understand, Russia is now not, not paying membership fee and not is uh, in, able to vote in the uh, Parliament and Assembly? Well, first of all, uh, I mean, we do, we do these campaigns all over, uh, all over the Council of Europe in all of our member states, and Russia is still a member state. Uh, there is a Council of Europe office in Russia as well that can provide these type of uh, important campaigns also in Russia and in many other member states of the Council of Europe. Um, Russia is currently not taking part in the work of the Parliamentary Assembly uh, of the Council of Europe. 
And this happened after uh, the resolution in 2015, where, uh, based on what on the events on Crimea and Donbas, where Russia was take Russia's right to vote was taken away uh, by this resolution that was voted in the parliamentary assembly. Uh, Russia then chose to leave the parliamentary assembly. And the situation with Russia now is that, that they are still not part of the parliamentary assembly, but they are a member of the Council of Europe. They take part in the Committee of Ministers. Mm -hmm. For Russia to return to the parliamentary assembly, they would have to apply, uh, which you can do once a year in January session, mm -hmm. uh, to get to apply for their credentials. And then for them to get their voting rights back, uh, there would have to be a, a sanction that would sort of, uh, sorry, there would have to be a resolution that would lift the current sanctions. Mm -hmm. And such sanctions is about occupation of Crimea and... It Donbass. was done, it, the resolution is, yes, about that. Uh, it will be election in the European Parliament. I know that it's not a Council of Europe, but still it will be some new reality after that in Europe. Uh, how it will influence, or would it influence uh, work of Council of Europe? Well, uh, I'm, I'm actually glad that you asked me this question because I think, I think it's important for everyone, including all of the viewers, to, to make the difference, make the distinction between Council of Europe and the European Union. The elections you're talking about is to the European Parliament that is part of the, of the European Union. Um, we, the Council of Europe, we have a different parliamentary assembly. Uh, that is not concerned with these elections at all. And um, to, answer, to, to answer to what will happen after the elections, well, first let's see what the elections will look like. Vice Minister of Foreign Affairs of Ukraine, uh, Sergei Kislevsa, said that uh, Council of Europe is in crisis, trying to prove that its values are not being sold. Uh, do you, can you confirm that crisis or because Russia stopped paying membership fee and Tur Turkey decreased membership fee, it's just a small temporary finance problem and need to reform the uh, Council of Europe because of that? Now, uh, Mr. Kislitsa, the Vice, Vice Minister, is a, is a colleague that I respect highly, uh, but his opinions that it will stand for him. For me, you are right. You say rightly that we, uh, at the Council of Europe, of course, we are facing challenges now. Everyone acknowledges that, uh, due to the non-payment of Russia and due to the decrease of payment from Turkey. Uh, currently, this is being addressed. The current chairmanship of the Committee of Ministers. This is Finland. Uh, they are having very serious discussion and they are looking how to come up with proposals on how to deal with these challenges. Uh, it's going to be very interesting to see what proposals they will come up with. There are also internal discussions on this, but uh, we will see uh, what type of suggestions will come up. Uh, I know that Council of Europe has some uh, entities like Venice Commission or Greco uh, how do uh, this organization working with Ukraine and how they help uh, to prevent uh, corruption or to prevent some uh, money laundering? Mm -hmm. um, well, this is also very important, uh, an important part of the cooperation between the Council of Europe and, and in this case Ukraine. Of course the cooperation goes with all of the member states. But what, for instance, Greco that deals with anti-corruption or Manival that deals with money laundering, mm -hmm. they have a system of monitoring and then reporting. So Greco or Manival, they monitor the, all of the member states in accordance to their standards. They give recommendations and then the member state provides a report back to, to these uh, instruments, to these to, for instance, to Manivol or to Greco on what they have done to address these in accordance with the Council of Europe standards. Mm -hmm. Venice Commission is a little bit different. They, based on the request on each member state, they provide opinions on different, uh, different legislative acts, such as it could be changes to the constitution or uh, it could be uh, related to, in Ukraine, it was, for instance, related to the high anti-corruption court. Uh, do you know the situation with education law? 
and yes. the situation between Ukraine and Hungary about education law. What is the final uh, decision of the Venice Commission? What was the final decision? Now, the final commission of the Venice Commission, they, they gave an opinion on the, on the, education, on the, on the education law, uh, where they had some recommendations regarding on the one hand, um, I mean, it's 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 hard to go into all of the details, of course. But I mean, do we need to change the education law or not? No. You, what what is what is stated is that there is one article that was criticised that need to to be addressed, and this uh, what Ukraine has replied to this is that they will address it in the secondary legislation related to education. So this is what we are now working with. Together with so you're already Ukrainian working partners. on this? Yeah, we are working okay, on this. Great. Yeah. Thank you, Mr. Enberg, for joining our program. Thanks to all who watched us. See you next week.